Recording is on. <clears throat> okay, good morning everyone once again. Welcome to BC213, our course on the end times. Uh, today I'm uh, speaking to us from home. I'm not uh, at the Bible College. I hope um, all the students from the Bible College are connected and uh, uh, yeah, thanks Nicole. I can see you and, uh, listening uh, to the lecture. And uh, of course, our online students are all connected as well. Okay, uh, may I request somebody to please pray and then we will get started. Anyone can pray. Can you hear me, Pastor? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, Pastor, I'm praying. Father God, we thank you for this time. Thank you for this day. Uh, as Pastor will uh, teach us about this subject, you help us to understand everything. You reveal everything from your word. You lead by your Holy Spirit. We surrender this class into your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. So <clears throat> we have been doing a quick overview of the book of Revelation just to get an idea of the sequence of events that will take place in the end times. And uh, one of the things that I've mentioned earlier is that um, we look at the book of Revelation uh, in the order in which God unveiled, the Lord Jesus unveiled it to John. And we say that it's going to unfold in that same manner, in that same sequence. Um, we are aware that uh, there are certain things in that sequence of events which are parenthetical in nature. That means there's a pause, like we saw in uh, uh, Revelation uh, chapter 10 when the angel tells John to eat the book, you know, that is something very specific to John and so on at that time. Then there are some that are reflective in nature, as we saw in chapter 12, and it takes us a little back in time saying, this is how that great dragon, the serpent, Satan was cast out of heaven. And then there are some that take us from the middle till the end, like we see in, chapter 11, when there are two witnesses, it tells us the whole story, or the whole, uh, what the two witnesses are going to do for three and a half years in, you know, one passage of scripture. So we recognize those things. But otherwise, in general, there's a sequence to the whole unveiling um, that we will stay with. We will not mix it up. So we have, we've covered till chapter, end of chapter 19 and chapter 20, actually. Um, and I, I'm just going to start from Revelation 1, just to just to quickly give us an idea or, or refresh our understanding. So Revelation 1, it's, the, it's John seeing the Lord Jesus right then. This is around eight, middle of AD 90, so around AD 95 or 96. Um, in the, within the first century. Revelation chapter 2 and 3 is the message or the messages the Lord Jesus is sending to the seven churches which existed at that time, right? So uh, it's things which are or which were at that time. From chapter 4 verse 1 is things that are yet to come. It's out in the future. Chapter 4 and 5 be said, have to do with what is in heaven or what is happening in heaven right after the rapture of the church. So the saints are in heaven. God is being worshipped and uh, it's happening right after the rapture of the church. And that's the time that the Lord Jesus goes and opens up the scroll, 
signifying that <clears throat> all the events that have to take place will begin to take place. So the scroll opens. Chapter 6, verse 1 is from the beginning of the tribulation, but it is about things happening here on earth. Chapters 4 and 5, beginning of the tribulation, but what's happening in heaven. Chapter 6, verse 1. <clears throat> Sorry. What's happening here on earth? So we see uh, chapter 6, um, and chapter 6, that is the seven seals of judgments being poured out on the earth. Chapter 7, very interesting. God marks 144,000 Jewish people as his servants during the tribulation. We don't know exactly why God chose, you know, to do this, but uh, it's almost like this is the original purpose for this nation. When God called Abraham, he said, through you I'm going to bless the nations all families of the earth and right here in the tribulation you know 144,000 Jewish people are mocked by God to serve him during the tribulation chapter 8 we see uh, the beginning of the seven trumpets so seven seal judgments are over and then seven trumpets start and uh, those judgments go on a lot of things are happening on the earth that is chapters uh, 8 and 9. Um, chapter 10 is what we mentioned. Uh, John is having an experience where the angel comes and says, eat this book because there is more prophecy you have to give. Chapter 11 verse 1 is what we said is right in the middle of the seven years of tribulation. Because Chapter 11, verse 1 onwards, it says there are 42 months that are left. 42 months means three and a half years, which means first three and a half years is over. Now you've got remaining three and a half years left. That's why we say Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 is the middle of the tribulation. So chapter 11, verse 1, we see two witnesses who are bearing witness for Jesus. Uh, most likely these are uh, Elisha and Enoch. And they are bearing witness for Jesus for the second half of the tribulation. Three and a half years. And uh, towards the end of that, they are killed, but God resurrects them up and they are taken into heaven. Chapter 12 is an interesting chapter because that's where we see that Satan makes his final attempt trying to get to heaven, but he can't. He's, he's forced back to the earth and he comes with great anger, knowing that he has a very short time left, only three and a half years left. So he comes with great anger and he goes after, specifically after the Jewish people who are followers of Jesus Christ, specifically after them, because he's angry because they are from uh, uh, the woman, that is Israel, who gave birth to the man-child, who is Jesus. So he goes after them. Chapter 13, this is in the second half of the tribulation, we are reading about the beast and the false prophet. The beast representing the Antichrist, the false prophet, representing another person who is, both these people are empowered by Satan. The beast is the Antichrist, the false prophet is empowered by the devil to do miraculous signs. And his goal is to get people to worship the image of the beast. Okay, so, so what we see in chapter 13 is, the Antichrist sets up a global economic system. That means you cannot buy or sell, except you have the mark of the beast. This false prophet sets up a world religious system, trying to get people everywhere to worship the image of the beast. 
So two things are happening side by side. A global economic system, a global religious system, being pushed by the Antichrist and the false prophet. In chapter 14, we saw that these 144,000 Jews who were who started serving God in the beginning of the tribulation now suddenly are in heaven. They're worshipping God. So we had a little thought on, you know, how did these people get to heaven? Uh, so uh, we don't know for sure, but we think that maybe they were raptured. Um, taken up into because there's no indication that they were killed and then went up there. I mean, that could be possible, but it's likely that they were raptured. And the reason is, you know, uh, Revelation 14 says that they were the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Revelation 14 verse 4. First fruits meaning the first set of people from nation of Israel, from the tribulation, who were taken up to God, raptured, from that, in that sense, first fruits. And then we also see in Revelation 14 that are, there are three angels who are making announcements. One is saying, you know, uh, one is preaching the gospel, believe the gospel. Second, another angel is saying, don't receive the mark of the, uh, is announcing the fall of Babylon. And the third angel is saying, don't receive the mark of the beast. And so God at this point is using angels to do his work. Now, generally, God doesn't do that in a global scale, in a big scale. Right now, angels are active. But God doesn't use them to be preaching to the nations because right now the church is God's, um, if you want to say, God's agent to the nations. So today the church, when I say church, it means body of believers, believers all over the world. We are the ones proclaiming the gospel. We are the ones, you know, declaring truth and so on. But in Revelation 14, 4, God is doing something which he did, he won't do in the church age. That is, use angels to announce to the nations the gospel, announce to them what is about to come, the fall of Babylon, and to warn them not to receive the mark of the beast. So, this also implies, and I'm not saying it's stated clearly, I'm saying it implies the fact that God is using angels to do this, implies that the church as we know it today is, has been taken out of the way. Are there believers during the tribulation? Yes. But remember that is a very difficult time because literally many, many, many people are martyred, are being killed for their faith in Christ during the tribulation. So, you know, we're just making a deduction here that God is using angels to do these announcements, which means the church is out of the way. It's not there. There are believers, uh, but it's very difficult to carry out the Great Commission at that time. Right? So he's using angels. And you also see in the end of chapter 14, the announcement about uh, the Great Harvest and the coming judgment. Right? There's going to be a great harvest of souls, people are going to be saved, but there's also coming judgment. And in Revelation chapter 14, the last few verses, uh, verses 18 to 20, it's talking about the wine press of the judgment of God, and blood is going to flow outside the city of Jerusalem as high as a horse's bridle, maybe you know, five feet high for about 180 miles. That's going to be so much devastation outside the city of Jerusalem. So that's what Revelation 14, end of it says. And that's speaking about the Battle of Armageddon. Revelation 16 are the beginning of the final set of seven judgments, the bold judgments. They are being poured out on the earth at that time. 
And two important things happen at that time. We see here that uh, uh, as these bold judgments are being poured out, when we come to the sixth bowl, that means this is the second last judgment. And this is in Revelation 16, verse 12. When we come to this point, something happens. It says here that the river Euphrates dries up. So that there can be a movement of the kings of the east to begin to the kings from the east that is in verse 12 revelation 16 12 kings or leaders of nations from the east of jerusalem or israel beginning to move towards israel to attack and uh, they're getting ready for the great battle the battle of the great day of god almighty the battle of armageddon so in the second last judgment the sixth ball the river euphrates dries up and armies of the world are beginning to get ready for this great battle of armageddon they're going to come converge on israel in order to destroy Israel as a nation, but that's the time God Himself will intervene. The Lord Jesus will intervene. So as this is, as you know, uh, the nations are preparing for the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 17, this world religious system collapses. So this is, uh, this was set up by the false prophet. And uh, the same leaders, the ten leaders who supported the Antichrist and therefore helped this false prophet come into great visibility, they reject. They reject the false prophet. And so, sorry. And so, this this whole religious system is rejected. There's a collapse of this world religious system. Chapter eighteen. There's a collapse of the world economic system. Literally in chapter 18, it says, in one hour, all their wealth is lost. Now, when you, when you think about this, we are living in a day and a time when something like this can happen, where, you know, people can have great wealth, and usually that wealth is uh, many times determined by, you know, the value of their investments and the stocks they have in markets and so on. And if the market collapses, their wealth just disappears, meaning it's no longer there. Otherwise, a person could be valued at so many millions, maybe billions of dollars. It's, oh, this man, he is worth so many billions of dollars. It doesn't mean he has that much money sitting in his pocket. No, no, no. It just, it's an assessment of the value of his investments and whatever he owns. And therefore, he's valued so much. But if those <clears throat> investments, all the things just vanish, his, his worth, his financial worth, his value gone, is gone. And it says here in Revelation 18 that all of this, the value, it just goes away in one hour, it disappears. The wealth of so many people. You know, if you read in Revelation 18, verse 19, it says, Revelation 18, 19, they threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. And as people had invested, they had put their trust in this economic system. And in one hour, everything is gone. Their wealth is gone. Right? We, we will read, you know, we'll read uh, all of this in detail in, in, in our third year when we'll study Revelation verse by verse and we're just giving an overview. So this is at the very end, remember. The second, the 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 the, 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 
seven bowls of judgment are been poured out. The nations are getting ready for the battle of Armageddon. And suddenly before their eyes, the world religious system is gone, economic system is gone, and they're moving into battle. And usually, when there is global conflict, it does affect the economic system. So, you know, it's, it seems very in line with what would normally happen. Revelation 19, uh, we, we get a glimpse of heaven. There is a marriage supper of the Lamb. This is towards the end of the seven years of tribulation. There is celebration in heaven. And then from heaven, we see Jesus coming with thousands and thousands of his saints, with the armies of heaven. And he comes and uh, with the word of his mouth, he destroys those who have gathered up, gathered against Jerusalem. The beast and the false prophet are caught and they are cast into the lake of fire. It says in Revelation 19, 20, then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two, the beast and the false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Right? So, that's the end. The battle of Armageddon ends with the Lord Jesus himself intervening, destroying all the armies that have come against Israel, Jerusalem, taking the beast, the false, uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet out of the way into the lake of fire. So now we pick up from chapter 20. So this was just a quick review. I wanted you, us to just uh, refresh ourselves with this whole sequence of events. So let's start now, chapter 20. So in chapter 20, the first thing we see is that Satan is bound for a thousand years. It says the dragon, the serpent of old, the devil and Satan is bound for the thousand years. So that means, you know, although it doesn't state it, it means the devil and all his evil spirits are taken out of the earth and bound for one thousand years, taken out of the earth. And then there is also a resurrection that happens here. He says in verse 4, the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, who had not received the mark of the beast, they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And that means the people who believed in Jesus who were martyred during the tribulation, they are resurrected. So, notice very carefully. It says here, this is, I'm, I'm looking at Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. It says very, very carefully, very specifically, those who died during the tribulation for the name of Jesus are resurrected. And they're going to reign with Jesus for a thousand years. So we will ask the question, hey, but what about all the believers who died before the tribulation? What about them? Ah, they were resurrected before the tribulation started. So they are there. They've come with Jesus. Revelation 19, they've come in their glorified bodies. So, this is another indication that the rapture, which is what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection um, and, and the catching up of the church to meet Jesus in the air with their glorified bodies takes place before the tribulation. So they're already there, every saint already has their glorified body. And then Revelation 20 verse 4, 
those who died, the believers who died during the tribulation, they are also resurrected with their glorified bodies. So, in the thousand year reign of Christ, every believer, every saint of God, meaning the Old Testament saints, we are all here on the earth to reign with Jesus. And we are here with our glorified bodies to reign with Jesus on the earth. So Revelation 20 verse 4 is an indirect, not a direct, but an indirect indication to us that the rapture of the church has taken place before the tribulation. Otherwise, he would have said in Revelation 20 verse 4, all the saints were resurrected. That means if the rapture was going to take place, and not the rapture, the resurrection of all the saints were going to take place at that time. No, he's only saying those who died during the tribulation for the name of Jesus, they are resurrected. Okay. So, <clears throat> in the thousand year reign of Jesus, there are all the saints of God who have their glorified bodies on the earth. But you also have the nations of the earth, unbelievers, who are still on the earth, have not died. They could have followed the Antichrist or, you know, whatever. They are still there on the earth. They did not die. And um, 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 and these people are assured. Did they go into the millennium, millennial reign of Jesus? And so, in the one thousand years of uh, in one thousand years of the reign of the Lord Jesus, there are the saints, and there are people who are not born again, who are unregenerate, who are also coming in. And that's why, during the 1000 year reign of Jesus, we have to teach the nations about the Lord. The nature, what, what do we know about the 1000 year reign of, of the Lord, the millennial reign? The nature of things are changed. Because the Bible describes this in Isaiah chapter 11, also in uh, um, Isaiah chapter 65. It says, The lion will lie down with a lamb. A child will play at the mouth of a snake's um, den. And, 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 and the very nature of things, people will beat their swords into plowshares. That means the nature of things are changed. But we still have to teach the nations about the Lord Jesus. Teaching them, discipling them. Um, you read about that in Zechariah, the 14th chapter, where people say, Come, let us go to the house of the Lord, for he will teach us his ways. You know, just point you to that verse. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 13 it says it shall Zechariah 14 verse 13 it shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand uh, Judah also will fight at Jerusalem the wealth of the surrounding nation shall be gathered together gold silver and apparel in great abundance and then I'm just skipping to verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone who's left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of the tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. The family of Egypt will not come and enter in. They shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which 
the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of, the taber of Tabernacles. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Um, everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. In that day, they shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. It's talking about Zechariah 14. It's, it's talking about you know how things will be during the millennium. And nations will be brought to come and worship the Lord at Jerusalem. Um, and you can read more on, 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 on the, uh, the life during the millennium in Isaiah, also in Isaiah 11. And uh, uh, <clears throat> Isaiah 11. Uh, I'll just read verses 6 to 9, just a portion of it, Isaiah 11, 6 to 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, the young one shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned wean child shall be put, put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So this is talking about the millennial reign of Jesus. And this is how things are going to be. The very nature, like I said earlier, the very nature of things will change, and it's going to be very different. And we will have work to do. Right? That uh, we will we will be people who will be serving the Lord. Um, Paul writes in First Corinthians six that we will rule over nations, will judge nations. Daniel chapter seven. Daniel spoke and said, "You know the saints will administer the kingdom here on earth." So that's going to happen during this one thousand year reign of Jesus. So go back now to Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. Now at the end of the thousand years, Satan is going to be released for a brief period of time. Um, we don't know, you know what that brief period of time is, but he's going to attempt to deceive the nations. And he's going to go specifically against... Uh, trying to mobilize people against Israel, specifically Gog and Magog. And again, these are tribes that are generally believed to be in Russia and that part of the world. But he's going to uh, try to mobilize people to go against... Okay, I think... Okay. So he's going to try and mobilize the nations against Israel one last time. And the Bible says in Revelation 20, uh, verse 9, that fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they'll be tormented day and night forever. So this is what the Bible tells us at the end of the millennium, the end of the thousand year reign of Jesus. So let me pause here and see if there's any questions that anyone has and then we can move forward. Any questions? You are follow me, following with me so far? Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> all right, no, no problem. So, so at the end of the thousand years, thousand year reign of Jesus, 
after Satan has been released for a brief moment, God allows him to make one last attempt against Israel, trying to deceive people, trying to get people away. And then God himself intervenes. And he destroys, I mean, he takes Satan out of the way, and this is it. It's the final, final judgment. Satan is taken out of the way. And then we see Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. There is what we refer to as the great white throne judgment. That means this is the last and final judgment. And the Bible says, every person who ever lived will stand before the throne of God. The judgment is already passed because they are standing separate. It's the sheep and the goats. On one side are, what are the sheep, meaning those who will enter into righteousness. On another side there are the goats, meaning those who will be dismissed forever from the presence of God. The Bible says every person who ever lived will stand before this great white throne judgment. And the books are open. So it's it's almost like an official proceeding. And you know, in, in that judgment, God is going to separate people. And uh, those who whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They will be sent away, it says in verse 15. And anyone not found written in the Book of Life was cast into the lake of fire, whose our name was not written in the Book of Life, was cast into the lake of fire. With this, everything ends. What happens <clears throat> next is that all the sheep, meaning the people who enter into righteousness, are transported to heaven. And God renovates everything with fire. Everything with fire. So we read about this in Second Peter chapter 3. Uh, Peter says, that the heavens and the earth that exist, they completely destroyed. So when you say the heavens, it means this current universe. And the earth is completely destroyed with fire. And then there, there, is, a, there is a new heaven and a new earth. And that's how Revelation 21 verse 1 begins. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So that, that description is given in Second Peter chapter 3. How the first heaven and the first earth is completely destroyed by fire, it's gone. And there's a new heaven and a new earth. That means this new heaven meaning the universe. Okay, so The believers are in heaven as in God's dwelling place. But when we see here a new heaven, we talk about this new universe, this celestial heaven, this heaven that contains all the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, I mean, all of that. This is a new atmosphere. And then on the, onto this new earth, God himself puts a city. And this city comes down from Jerusalem comes from Jerusalem to be put upon this new earth. And that's amazing. That means this new earth is not going to have anything that man built. The earth today, yeah, it has everything that people have built here and there and everything. But everything is going to go away. There's going to be a new earth. On, a, on this new earth, uh, Revelation 21, verse 2, the holy city, New Jerusalem, which is in heaven where God dwells. God is going to tr 
runs for that onto the earth. It's likely that this is the place where Jesus has built all our mansions. Remember Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come and receive you. So that's the mansions in that city. And that heavenly city, Jerusalem, is transferred to the earth. In Revelation 21 and 22, describe this new earth, which has this new city. And uh, the new city, the new city of Jerusalem. And uh, it gives us many details. It says that there's no need for the sun. There's no need for, uh, because <clears throat> God himself is the light of the city. So that means we're not receiving light from outside. God himself is our light. So everything's going to be different from the way we know it today. In this new earth, new heaven, new earth, and the new city of Jerusalem. Uh, there will be no sickness, no pain, none of the things that we know today, none of it will be there. And uh, uh, he says, you know, in Revelation 22, there's a river of life flowing through it, the tree of life, signifying that people are going to be in perfect health, and we're going to be in that place. Right? Now, what, what exactly is going to be done over there, we don't know. Because beyond Revelation chapters 21 and 22, we don't have uh, much information on what life is going to be like in the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, and uh, this is all we have. And Revelation chapter 22 ends by saying that Jesus says, I come quickly, my reward is with me. Right? So we, uh, we, the church, so it says Revelation 22, verse 17, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, as the church, we say, come Lord Jesus, we are waiting for all these things to unfold. We are waiting for this. Okay, so, um, we have a few more minutes. Any questions so far on this? Okay. So we will stop here for today. And uh, next week, uh, we will continue uh, and what we want to do is, we want to look at the signs of the end times. So what we did was we went through a sequence of events. And I will review this again. Uh, we will look at the chart and we'll review by looking at the chart. So I just want you to be very clear. This is the sequence of events. And then we will start looking at the signs of the times. What are the indications that uh, we are very close to the end. So we'll look at that. That'll be the uh, last segment that we, uh, last section that we need to cover in this course. So the primary objective of this course is to give us an overview of uh, the events that are going to take place in the end times and the things that lead us to those things, the end times. Okay? Uh, may I request somebody to please close in prayer and then we will dismiss, please. <clears throat> Anyone can pray. All right, um, just want to request somebody to pray. <clears throat>
Hmm. Go ahead. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful time, Lord. Lord Jesus, uh, thank you for your with us. Lord Jesus, thank you for helping Pastor to take the class, Lord. Lord Jesus, he is physically uh, feeling not well. Uh, God, Lord Jesus, heal him immediately. You are the Jehovah Rapha. We are believing that uh, you will walk on him, Lord Jesus. In, very fast, he will become, he will recover from which situation he is going through. Lord Jesus, especially we will learn about a revelation. Father, Lord Jesus, we are hopefully waiting for your second coming. Lord Jesus, mm -hmm. we are believing that we are experienced. We want to experience that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. So we won't have our next hour. Hmm? Uh, we will continue uh, this end times course next week. Hmm? Thank you, everyone. God bless. Bye now.